Um, we're going to talk a little bit about water properties, and this will segue into water chemistry. So like I said, um, maybe today, if not today, it'll be next uh, next day, we're going to do a lot more calculations. Um, and maybe that being said, I don't know if you noticed, I posted on, um, on Moodle this morning that we will have our first test next Monday. Okay, so pencil that in. Um, I'm going to decide how much material will be covered in the test. I'll decide that on Wednesday, kind of based on, on where we get, uh, but probably we'll cover up until Wednesday's lecture. So, all of topic one and a little bit of this uh, chemistry stuff that we're going to get into. So, probably some basic calculations, hopefully, things that you've seen before around concentration, right? How do you know you got so many grams of this and you know, how many grams per mole do you have and convert that to moles per liter, those kind of things. Uh, and hopefully, I'm hoping we can do parts per million as well, which is really important in, in um, environmental uh, sciences. So, kind of the segue into this is just talking about water properties. So, this is water here, and uh, you know you probably know it's H two O. So, you know you've got the O, and you've got oh my, my marker is a little bit on the weekend. Hopefully, that's dark enough for you. And uh, you know, if we're thinking about our chemistry, water does have a couple of extra. Uh, sets of unpaired electrons. And, uh, you know, when I look at this molecule here, I always remember that oxygen has a partial negative charge and hydrogen has a pos uh, partial positive charge. Anyone know what this little swaley is? Is it Uh Yeah, okay, yeah, yes, yes. Um, it's, it's, it's a Greek letter. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> Uh, I can't remember which Greek letter this is, um, but it means it uses a dipole there. Yeah, and it's a partial charge. I think it looks like a little, little S in my mind, and so I think it's slightly negative and slightly positive. So, you know, I, you know, I'm trying to associate my brain with what that means. And so, you know, that's, that's the way the water molecule works. So it's bent, and it says here what kind of bonding is present, right? Uh, and so you probably know. There's another marker that's half dead. Uh, what kind of bond is that? Uh, not quite, no. That's a covalent bond. Talk about hydrogen bonding in a second. So this is a covalent bond. And a hydrogen bond is if you have another water molecule. So in this case here, I have this on the next slide. My writing is sloppy. I have, I have no practice whiteboarding this year. <laughs> um, so you've got a partial positive and partial negative charges on this. And so what you end up with is um, what you said, you've got a dipole interaction. And a hydrogen bond is actually a relatively intense dipole interaction. So this is my hydrogen bond. And so it's a little bit stronger than your normal dipole interaction, not as strong as a um, not as strong as an ionic bond, um, but it's strong enough that it gives water some unique properties. And, uh, you know, so water molecules are kind of a little stickier than a lot of other chemical molecules. So here's the uh, picture I found it. That's a Wikipedia image. And kind of just what I drew on the board there. And like I said, you can see all of these little dipoles happening here. And so this, this affects water's properties, right, in terms of these things like melting points and boiling points and things like that, which is what we're going to talk about right now. So by the way, hydrogen bonds, right? You know, we need to know what a hydrogen bond is. So I kind of have a list of some of the properties that are relevant to uh, environmental chemistry. Uh, some of them here are like cohesive and adhesive properties. So you can see the difference here. Cohesive means water can stick to itself. And I'll show you some examples of that. Adhesion means it can stick to other things. So this is relative to other chemicals. Water is actually a little bit more sticky than usual. So this has some consequences, right? So this is showing both adhesion and cohesion, right? So in plants, think about it. You've got these massive, massive trees, and water is working against gravity to get from the soil all the way up to the upper extremities. Particularly, some of these trees are, are absolutely massive. And this is just from the hydrogen bonding. So the water sticks together, but it also uh, adheses to uh, the inner side of the vascular parts of the plants. Um, I was going to show you a really cool video off of YouTube on this, but it was, it was really long, kind of showing the process. Um, you can probably find it if you just Google it, but uh, this is because water is sticky. You can do this. Partly diffusion, too. Yeah. 
Uh, cohesion is water just kind of how it sticks together. And this is why when it forms droplets, it'll, it'll bead up. And um, also there's a little bit of a, uh, kind of almost a little bit of skin on the surface of water. So you probably are familiar with, uh, you know, these kind of things, right? These water insects. Uh, I don't know if that's the right term, but I used to call this a water strider when I was a kid. Is that the right name? This would be a thing to ask David or, or um, uh, somebody else who knows about these things. And the interesting fact about the water striders is that the reason they're able to walk on the water is because they have tiny errors on, the, on their legs that are resistant. They have that extra surface area. Yeah, yeah for sure. I, I used to watch them. I had a, actually had a creek going through my, my parents' yard, and I used to watch them all the time in a couple of spots. It was pretty cool. I want to show you this video here. Maybe you've seen this lizard here. Uh, sometimes it's featured in these uh, nature videos and because it's really cool. This is a, a basilisk. Basilisk. A basilisk? Yes. Ah. Just my tongue not getting it out today. I'll show you this video here. It should be at uh, all. Oh, it's not the video I thought it was. It's Could 5G already? Too many. You can see that actually another. Uh, I'll just go be back dead back in the water. If you still think 5G is still. The next big investment. You see, it actually has it's a young movie. Costa Rican. So it has this it. loaded up ahead of time with the computer thing that I'm messing up there. You can see it has another name. They call it the Jesus Christ Lizard. And you can see why food. it's called that. So we'll just this way have been nicknamed the yeah. Jesus Christ Lizard. Why? This adult male, probably the father of the young lizards, can't tell us. Nor can this female, exclusive property of a territorial male. It has nothing to do with the feeding habits of a basilisk, which consists primarily of insects and berries. This predatory reptile will help reveal the secret as it stalks the young basilisk. Have you seen these videos before? Cool. The basilisk is called the Jesus Christ lizard because it can walk and, well, maybe run on water. It bicycles its hind legs and the tail becomes a counterweight. That's good. We can't know what the snake is thinking. Did it really want to eat the lizard, or did it just want to show? Yeah, that's a, that's cool. Like it's so it's a, when it says it uses its tail as a counterweight. Yeah, so the, the like you were saying with the feet, um, if you look at the, they kind of have these padded feet, and it, probably that's about the largest thing that could do that. Uh, there was actually a MythBusters episode on that where they tried to do that with the counterweight, and the episode's a big foamy tail and. And some big, uh, like they had to make some big shoes like this, and they made it about this far into the water, and then they just went in. But um, this is from this is from basically this hydrogen bonding, this uh, kind of uh, cohesive property that forms. Like I said, you can almost think of a little bit of a skin on there, um, where it can uh, it can hold these these animals up. Uh, something else really important with water is it stabilizes temperatures. So again, a little bit more chemistry for you. Um, in terms of the chemistry here, what we're talking about is something called uh, mostly specific heat or heat capacity. And this is the amount of energy it takes to uh, warm water up, basically the amount you know, per, per gram per uh, degree Celsius, right? And uh, since water, it sticks together really well, it actually takes a significant amount of energy to uh, raise it a degree or two or so on. So you probably know in a lot of machinery and large industrial applications, water is, uh, is a main coolant, partly because it's cheap too, but it works really, really well. But this has uh, impacts uh, on the environment. Uh, there's just some numbers there for you. I don't care so much about the numbers. But uh, if you go to a place like uh, California, right? So uh, you've been you know, to some of these areas in California, so you know, Disney World is somewhere over there. Um, probably know California is a pretty nice place. Right? It's not a desert. But if you go kind of inland, this is all desert in here. And um, what is happening is that we have the ocean, and the ocean absorbs a lot of the heat uh, that would normally be drying up this entire region here. 
So as opposed to having a big desert here along, along the uh, ocean, we have, you know, nice sunny, lovely California. I like California better. Been there a couple of times, it's very nice. Uh, biologically too, it's, it's a good thing to cool us down, right? So we sweat when we're hot, uh, hopefully not that much in, in, the, in the wrong situation, um, but it's, it's good to cool us down, right? And as it evaporates, it takes away that heat and uh, it works to uh, help us with our homeostasis. Uh, what else do I hear? Expands when it's frozen. So the density of water changes with temperature. What is density, by the way? That's it. Yeah. So density, maybe I'll write that down because I don't think I have it on the slide. So density space here. So density is mass per volume. So usually it's uh, um, usually like in, in grams per milliliter or or something like that, right? So uh, I'll show you some pictures here. It says here, how does water structure change as temperature changes, right? So in vapor form, so vapor, uh, you've got these molecules and they're just separated. They're not really interacting so much, right? Water form, there's some interactions, but they're kind of you know slipping around a little bit, which kind of makes it liquidy. And then in solid form, um, there's just not enough heat and things to stop moving, basically. And in the case of water, uh, it locks together and it forms hydrogen bonds in kind of a predictable crystalline kind of lattice. So these, these crystals are, are kind of hexagonal shape. And if you take a look here at the liquid compared to the solid form, these are actually pushed apart a little bit because they're forming a nice ordered lattice. And so it turns out that water is actually less dense uh, when it's in a solid form compared to liquid form. So this has huge biological implications. Um, there's actually a curve. It turns out water is the most dense at around four degrees Celsius. So, uh, you know, you can see that ice is, uh, is down here and it's less dense. And so the consequences is for us that our ice cubes float when we have a drink. Uh, for animals, um, this is just another diagram. Just trying to show you some diagrams here. This is this this is why aquatic organisms can survive in the winter, right? We had it the other way around. Ice would form at the bottom of the lake and work its way upwards, and the fish would be in a lot of trouble. Instead, you know, it freezes on the top, and the fish can swim around and you know munch all winter long, and and they're okay, right? Um, you know, they don't we don't need any. Uh, uh, scuba equipment or anything like that, right? Um, but I'll show you this one here. You guys seen this one? So why penguins have so much fun? I'll play this for you. This one's pretty good. Did you see it? I don't think this is, uh, I'm pretty sure this is some sort of, uh, you know, computer <laughs> trickery. But uh, I'll show you. There's another one. Ready for this one? Oh, this is not the other one. This is the other one. There we go. And there's the other one. Ah. All right, one more time. So these are these are different fakes, right? I'm pretty sure I found one one time on the same one where she does a kung fu kick or something like instead. And then, you know, you've got ice on top and water on the bottom. I don't know what kind of penguins they are, but it's kind of blurry. And I wouldn't be able to pick out different ones if you don't ever sit in front of me. So water is also a powerful solvent, and uh, this is going to be what's really important when we get into our next unit because, of course, water is solubilizing so many things. And there's a lot of important things uh, in our water um, that are essential for health and conductivity and all sorts of other things. So you can see what water does as a solvent is it's basically what a solvent does is interacts with whatever is, is solubilized in it. So you can see in this case here, we've got sodium uh, chloride, so that's table salt. and uh, Sodium is positive and chloride is negative, and so water can interact with positively charged chemicals because of the oxygens, and water can interact with negatively charged molecules, the, uh, the hydrogens. Is it fact, you know, uh, even though uh, sodium chloride can uh, get with water really well, mm -hmm. but sodium by itself, when we react with water, it's very actually kind of explosive. Yeah, yeah, and that, that just shows you, you know, that's sort of the, what. If you think about chemistry in general, right? You start off like sodium is one thing, 
and it gets transformed into an ion, which is like not half as dangerous, right? And that's kind of you know the interesting thing about chemistry is you can have one, you know, when things in one form, it could it's gonna have entirely different properties than when it's in another form. Acid base properties. So this is uh, kind of going to be talked about a little bit in this week's lab. Um, this week's lab, you guys are going to uh, um, you have one main exercise, and then sort of the, the a small exercise is, is uh, using the pH meters. Uh, so uh, you know, kind of just a, an introduction to, to pH anyway. And uh, what does pH mean? pH means the amount of hydrogen that's in something. And so water itself is uh, considered a weak acid in the glucose. And uh, so that means that it can uh, interact with acids and bases and you can have acidic or alcoholic solutions. So we're going to come back to this formula uh, eventually here. So we'll have to talk about uh, how we can do those calculations. I think there's a couple in the lab uh, just for practice. If you can't do them this week, it's not a problem. Uh, those calculations are just for practice or grades yet. Uh, but we'll be uh, we'll be looking at examples uh, when we get there in the, in the lecture. Uh, here's the pH scale, probably somewhat familiar with some of these things. You can see uh, uh, up on the, the top half of the pH scale, uh, that's the acidic place. And you can see most beverages that we have are acidic, so Coca-Cola, orange juice, and so on. Obviously, anything with the word acid in it, like battery acid, is going to be acidic. And then the bottom half here is the alkaline portion. So pure water is right there in the middle, uh, which is uh, neutral at 7. And so blood is about pH of 7.4, 7.6. You know, your physiology and what you've recently exercised and things like that. Seawater and uh, a lot of cleaning things are uh, kind of you know, re relatively reactive uh, alkaline products. So more on that too. Uh, and then lastly, viscosity we have there. And uh, so this will be important kind of halfway through this course. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, high hydraulics, right? So, you know, water moving through pipes, right? And uh, that's just lab five, I think we're going to address this. Uh, and it turns out that there's friction, right? Water will actually have friction as it just passes through a tube, right? And so, um, you know, we're not going to talk too much about this, but different materials of tubes. You can imagine some are kind of smooth. You can have a concrete pipe, which is rough, uh, metal versus different types of plastics, uh, but even the, uh, the diameter of the tube is going to affect the water flow through them and pressure. So again, a bit more on this later. This is all kind of introductory stuff that we're going to get to eventually. Okay, so what property water gives it unique properties? See, see, that's what I want you guys to remember. Water can form hydrogen bonds, and this is the key to why it is a unique molecule. Really, really important. There's other water properties we are going to talk about. We're going to talk about water hardness. So, if you don't know what hardness is, it's the amount of calcium, magnesium, and sometimes other divalent ions that are in there. Um, so that will cause like a scaling on your on your pipes. Um, so you probably have a little bit of a hardness, sometimes it affects the taste of the water and how well your shampoo emulsifies and those kind of things. We're going to talk a little bit of conductivity. Obviously, oxygen is important for biological things. And, uh, well, water can do other things, like form rainbows, which we're not going to really talk about this course, but I think it's kind of cool. So, uh, just to finish off, this, okay, I'm not going to play this video for you. This is just for reference. Kind of a fun um, video if you want to check out. It's seven minutes long. Uh, but just to finish off, I wanted to mention that uh, at the end of every topic, um, I'm going to have some some uh, questions. Okay. So so this one here, here's some study questions to you know things to think about as you're getting ready for test one. Uh, topic two, I don't have them at the end of the PowerPoints. So I actually have some separate documents because topic two I have a lot of calculation type questions. So uh, I uploaded those today. If you go on rule, you can see there's, I think it's problem set one, problem set two, or practice questions one, practice questions two. And uh, you can go through the questions and I also have solutions for each of the questions. So those are to help you with study purposes, right? So uh, we're not quite that far in. But you can see there's some, some things that I kind of went through and was like, okay, I think this is important to know, this is important to know. So uh, as you study, take a look at these study questions. 
Yeah, so when you say sources for uh, would I be are you talking about the rivers like the Fairwater River, the Hanstone River? Yes. The, yeah, so this one here, right? If you take a look, there's a slide on that. So for example, Fort McMurray, we get our water from um, the Athabasca River. Uh, Fort Chippewa gets their water from Lake Athabasca. Right? So those are some of the uh, so then like, we all get the same kind of water. So the Athabasca. Yeah, water. and it's all from the same watershed. Just kind of depends on exactly where the community is. Right, like uh, Anzac is also from a um, uh, river, but then if you go down the road to Conklin, they're, I think, Christina River or something like that, which is because they're a little bit off track, right? Uh, fun fact about the Clearwater River that's the, that's the one river for, I'm going to share with uh, Fort McMurray, also shares the Saskatchewan. Yes, yeah, yeah, I was actually talking to someone who canoed it. And they started in Saskatchewan and made it all the way here to Portland, where it is. That sounds really cool. So, pencil it in on my things and maybe to do someday. <laughs> so, some last thoughts, right? Uh, water quality is really kind of boring from a whole bunch of other areas of, uh, and disciplines, right? You know, we're going to be doing some chemistry, we're going to be doing some biology, um, there's some geology in there, and a uh, little, little bit of all sorts of other things in there. Uh, I think I mentioned before, I uh, you know, I think uh, most students usually kind of enjoy this course, particularly the labs. They're really fun. They're very hands-on. It's kind of a little something a little different every week, and they're not usually so stressful, you know, because they don't usually go a full three hours. And, um, you know, uh, like I said, nice variety of things. I hope you enjoy the course. Um, I will be uh, working closely with Pamar uh, with the labs. She'll be running them. Uh, I will probably pop in uh, at the beginning. She has uh, not run this, these labs before, so. I'll probably pop in at the beginning just to make sure um, she can find everything. And, you know, and there's always a little quirks to point out. Oh, you know, this thing here, you might have to, you know, things like that, right? So if you have any questions about that as well. Okay, so where are we here? 130. Okay, let's talk about some chemistry here. So I think actually right at the beginning, I was going to show you another video. An introductory video. I found this on Yahoo. We might have to watch an ad for five seconds. Okay, there's the ad. So I'll play this for you. This is um, a little thing off of Yahoo. We're going to be talking about Brita water versus tap water versus bottled water. We'll see. Uh, we'll see what they can say about it anyway. I'll play this for you. I tested uh, brittle water, tap water, and a bottled water for anionic content, which basically means chlorides, nitrates, and sulfates, as well as for total organic carbons. Uh, total organic carbons basically means everything except for inorganic carbons like carbonates uh, in water, and as well, I tested for lead content in the water samples, each one. First of all, I was not surprised to find that the brittle water and the tap water had very little to no difference between them uh, with respect to all characteristics, both with total organic carbon, which basically means it doesn't really remove anything, and with respect to chlorides, nitrates, and sulfates, I did not see any difference between uh, the samples. I, when I ran the, 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 the test uh, with the brittle water and the tap water, I noticed that uh, the samples, the brittle water was slightly lower, but statistically speaking, it wasn't enough for me to say that the, the, that the brittle water actually removes the uh, total organic carbon content. I found that the bottled water, in uh, with respect to nitrate concentration, was five times higher than tap water, and the sulfate about maybe seven times higher uh, than the tap water. We looked at both tap water, brittle water, uh, bottled water, and luckily none of them showed any lead content in them. I drink tap water. Uh, I drink tap water because I guess I've seen it. So before I had my students run some samples, so I'm pretty safe with it. Um, I do let the water run in Toronto and the outlying GTA area. We've always had a consistent level of water, good water, so it's safe. But we do test our water. I know they test it regularly. You have a population of about five million in this GTA. Uh, it's a vital and paramount concern that if the water has to be tested, and I'm sure it's tested 
on a daily basis. So I, I don't drink bottled water. So the collagen and Amazon spring. Try hard to get a better signal on your cell phone. That would be considered bottled water. Yeah. Now he doesn't really go into it a lot. And if you take a look at bottled water, um, there's a big range of what it means to be bottled water, yeah. right? Um, Aquafina, for example, I believe is uh, run by Pepsi, and it's literally tap water, and it's sort of right. So I think they're deionizing a little bit. Um, and uh, apparently putting some carbon filters to remove who knows what. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at uh, Aberfoyle water, that is actually from the town of Aberfoyle, where they have a spring, <laughs> and it's natural water. And I think it's it, it's filtered, so it's from a stream. And so that actually has more ions in, and, uh, uh, than aquifer, right? So it kind of depends what you mean by, by bottled water, because there's different, different scenarios, right? If you get something like, uh, uh, you know, something more high class like Perrier, it actually has more ions in it because that's what gives it its flavor, you know, whatnot. But most bottled water is actually stuff that's uh, it's, uh, done industrially, uh, it's uh, tap water, and they usually put it through some carbon filters and maybe something else, right? And uh, um, and then soften it up so it might have a, a little bit of taste, right? I know some people uh, are really sensitive, they don't really like hard water so much, so they, you know, bottled water, they like. Taste better. It's all a matter of preference. I grew up on well water, so you know whenever I taste city water, you know it's, I can taste the chlorine always, right? Um, I don't mind it. I just it's a matter of preference. But he's saying, you know, in terms of what he could measure on the safety aspect, he didn't have any concerns, and uh, that's that's kind of what you're going to see in most places, at least large communities across Canada. Uh, tap water, you know, we have very high standards in Canada. Um, Notice it's in very large communities. There's a number of remote communities, particularly Aboriginal communities, that have issues with water treatment. And uh, I don't know exactly what all the issues are, but in many cases, they don't have treatment facilities. And, uh, and so, um, you know, uh, that, that's part of the issue, right? So um, let's talk about some water chemistry. And we're going to talk a lot about uh, kind of, you know, what can be dissolved in water, right? So I'm hoping. That uh, by next day we're going to kind of you know be here, and that this is what the test will cover part A and part B. Um, the water hardness, I'm not sure if we'll quite get there. We'll see anyway. But I want to talk about ions and uh, different ways to talk about concentrations. So I guess the first question here is: oh, there's some there's some resources. By the way, I have a lot of links on these. Sometimes I'll put what I think are the most important ones at the beginning of the powerpoints. Um, you know, so if you're if you're struggling with, with some areas around say mill equivalents, we're going to talk about here's here's a link that I thought was pretty decent on mill equivalents. So there's something that we're going to talk a lot about, and uh, they're kind of just a little bit of a different way of thinking around the chemistry. They're not too bad, and I'll try to point out what I think you know are the there's going to be one formula, for example, that's going to be important to know. Um, but after that, it's just not too bad. And then hardness and, uh, you know, some samples around having to hardness and, and alkalinity. So some definitions, hopefully you know these ones. Grid six, somewhere around there, you learn about solutions. Um, solution is a mixture of two things. It doesn't have to be liquid, by the way, right? Um, brass is a solution of metals. It has copper and I'm not sure what else in it, um, and that's a that's a, um, a solid solution. But usually, when we think of the solutions, we're usually thinking of liquids, and probably usually we're thinking about something dissolved in the water. And in this class, it will always be water, uh, and that will be the solvent, the thing of which the solvent, um, the solutes are dissolved in. Okay, so just some reminders, uh, you know, to use those words. That's what they are. Uh, probably not going to use them. So it says here, what types of particles are dissolved in water? Uh, and there's a big list here. And uh, uh, like I said, think some things we're going to talk about. Uh, and a big thing that we're going to talk about a lot, a huge part of water analysis is what ions are in there. Right? So we've already talked a little bit about sodium uh, chloride. Uh, we talked about uh, the guy mentioned lead, uh, calcium, magnesium. And sometimes these will give water various properties. Right? So lead, for example, is toxic. We don't want that in water. Um, a little bit of sodium, a little bit of chloride is going to make a meal. A little too much is going to taste salty. Right? 
Uh, has anyone ever had mineral water that tasted kind of salty? Yeah, so sometimes there's sort of that edge, right? So I mentioned Perrier. Um, I found out my brother really likes Perrier and kind of got into it a little bit. I mean, it's tasty. Like it's, it's not bland, right? Um, but then I tried another mineral water and it was certainly on that edge of where it's like, okay, that's too much. And, you, and I would call it salty. Uh, hardness, like I said, calcium and magnesium, acidity, not really. And then there's a few other things that are going to be important we'll get to eventually. So dissolved gases like oxygen is the important one for, uh, for biological things uh, and organic compounds as well. So what's an ion? What do I mean by ion? Well, an ion is something that either loses or gains in it. Yeah. So it's it's, uh, it's either uh, has too many or enough electrons so it has a charge. Um, so you know sodium is an example here, and uh, there's a whole bunch here to know. Um, so maybe you can tell me if you know these ones. So that one is an easy one, right? That one's sodium. And uh, we also mentioned actually I'll put them in two groups. This one is chloride. So what's it called if you have a positive charge? Do you know the word for that? So that's a cation, yes. I always have to think about that one. <laughs> and I'll tell you, my, tell you my thought process. I remember when I was a university student my very first year, we were talking about cations for some reason, and one guy says, yes, and I already remember what a cation is because it's like a cat. Cats are a positive thing. And whether you agree with that or not, I remember that conversation. <laughs> And, and that's how I remember which is which, still to this day. And then, of course, we have analytics. Uh, what else do we have here? Um, well, there's this one here. Which one is that? Potassium. Potassium, good. Potassium. And what else do we have in here? Okay. Uh, this one. This one. That's right, calcium and magnesium. I'm going to try, there's a marker here at C, let's see if this one's any better. It is! All right, we're in business. Look at that. Oh, oh so much better. Um, okay, what else do I have here? Okay, now there's these, these, these complex ions, right? Um, so we have, uh, let's see here. Sorry, that's not a positive, that's a negative. So which one's that one? That one's sulfate, yeah. So you can, um, for sulfate, by the way, you can use a pH or an F, it doesn't matter. Okay, the international standard is an F. If you're British, it's a pH. If you're Canadian, it's, we don't know. <laughs> we use the American or the British thing. Um, so I don't know here, right? Uh, it doesn't matter. You can use F or or pH for salting. Uh, what else do I have here? A couple others that are important. Um, over here we have NH4. Oops. Four should be down there. And the plus should be up there. You know what that one is? That one's ammonium. Good. And I think that's the only platonic ion that's positive. Uh, I don't know. It's the only one I have here. So, oh, okay, a couple more. So, that one there, fluoride. And I thought I had, oh, yes, okay. Do not forget. Oh, I meant to put, okay, I, I messed this up. Sorry. I'm going to put all my positives here, my negatives here. And sometimes when my brain is talking and you're doing things and you just, it just keeps going and you have to deal with most of your mistakes here. I apologize for that. But these ones here are negative. I've got this one here. I've got HCO3 negative and CO3 2 negative. I don't know what those ones are. The first one's bicarbonate or hydrogen carbonate. And then that's right. The second one is the carbonate. The bicarbonate and carbonate. But I don't actually know why this one's called bicarbonate because I don't see two of anything. There's probably some reason. Um, that's a Google to tell me, but I just don't know the answer. 
I'm looking at, I got a big list here. Those are kind of the important ones, right? For this class, they're going to pop up again and again. I mean, we can do iron, right? What's the, what's the atomic symbol for iron? Caffeine. Yeah. Um, kind of comes up once in a while. Doesn't really usually affect humans' health. Um, might make your water a little reddish, so we'll, we'll see it there, here, and there. So there's a few, everything there on the list. So these things have bromide. I guess I didn't mention bromide. It doesn't usually come up that often in water analysis, um, but it does once in a while in, in very tiny concentrations on there. And you can see this is kind of showing, uh, it's comparing seawater uh, to fresh water, right? And maybe that's why it's on this list because it's found in small quantities in, uh, in seawater. So most of these ions you're going to find uh, in natural sources. Uh, fluoride, maybe, maybe not. So around Fort McMurray, there's natural fluoride in the geology here, so we find it in the river. Uh, in other places, no. Uh, it kind of just depends on where you are. All right, no clock in here. This is like, it used to be. They renovated this room and removed the clock out of the mess. Oh, so I'm glad I grabbed my uh, cell phone. So it says here, ions are sometimes referred to as electrolytes, so they can conduct electricity. So we're going to talk about conductivity a little bit later on. Can you talk about conductivity in your fall classes? Seems to me it used to be part of one of those classes, but maybe they, they switched things around a little bit. So um, the more ions you have in the solution, the more conductivity, the more electricity you can go through something. So we're going to talk about conductivity a little bit later on in this class, and we're going to be measuring it in lab three. Uh, and and uh, so you're going to see that there's a correlation between how many ions are in something and the higher uh, the amount of electricity you can pass through a solution. So a little bit more on that later. So I want to say a little bit about some of these uh, ions um, and some other sources. You can see this is uh, talking about some of the sources. And this is the kind of conversations that I'll have with Neil, because he knows all about the geology and it's all about the rocks and the soils and all these kind of things. And I'm just really, you know, I know this much, and he knows like way too much about this stuff. But uh, you can see a lot of these, like I said, are from natural sources. Um, you know, you've got clays and, and uh, you know, uh, calcium, of course, is, is from, uh, from limestone in many cases, those kind of things. Uh, some of these things are associated with pollution, so salt, for example, uh, sodium chloride uh, is, is a big component, of course, so when we're salted roads and highways. Um, it's not as bad up here because we use dirt more than we use salt. But um, when I was living in, in southern Ontario, uh, it was nuts, right? Every single time it rained, just the roads would be coated in you know, salt everywhere. And, and all spring long, you'd see these stains of salt everywhere because because uh, of the temperatures, right? Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're concerned about ice rain there, of course. Uh, bicarbonate, carbonate, you can see limestone is a big thing. And of course, there's lots of that around here in Alberta, right? Okay, so I think we talked a little bit about ionization. And I mentioned that a big part of, um, of the fact that these things are soluble in water is because they can interact with water chemically. So you can see there's there's uh, sodium chloride again, and the chloride here, and the, the partial charges on water, and the sodium and the partial charges on water interact with it. So that's kind of you know an important thing, right? So things is charged, usually it can uh, uh, solubilize in water. Probably talk a lot about more about solubility of things that can't uh, in organic chemistry, um, because there are of course many things that don't uh, solubilize in water. Question or I thought I saw something new. Yeah. I want to name it just like the iron. Oh, I mean, no worries. I uh, don't really have too much new to say about that, but I think what I will do is finish off uh, just introducing some formulas, and next day we'll do some examples of them. So some of these you've seen before, some of them are going to be new to you. Okay, so uh, you've probably seen molarity, right? That's Chem 101. It goes way back to grade 11 chemistry, and uh, you calculate molarity, it's just moles per liter. So the number of moles divided by the volume, and you're going to get a concentration of units are going to be moles per liter for the big M. Okay, so just a reminder, it's really important that you get your units straight. Okay, I find for some reason in my one class, my biology class, people want to use this M and this M interchangeably, right? 
This one means meters, and this one means moles per liter. So it's important if you have the wrong M, you have the wrong units. And uh, so do make sure you get your, your, uh, your units correct uh, in this class. There's another one called molality. Has anyone ever heard of that one? So I learned it back in the days when I did chemistry. But back when I learned chemistry, it was old school. <laughs> so now it's like old, old school, right? Um, this, you see it once in a while, and we will never use it in this class. But you can see the slight difference is that it's rather than moles per liter, it's moles per kilogram. So once in a while, you'll see that on a, on a chemical, we order chemicals for the labs, and we'll see uh, molality. And it's kind of, uh, it's like, what's that again? And I always have to look it up every time. We are going to be talking about uh, percent volume, or more correctly, we're going to be usually talking about percent mass. So sometimes, uh, you know, in the medical community, they might talk about a, you know, let's say a 1% saline solution, right? A 1% saline, that means it's 1% salt. And this is how they calculate, right? The mass of solute. Uh, over the total mass of solution and then times 100 to get a percent. Okay, so we'll do some samples of those next week. Um, it doesn't stop. This is a big part of this course, is understanding all these concentrations. So parts per million, this is huge. Pretty much all water analysis will bring things back in parts per million because um, this is, in terms of the, the concentration, probably the most useful amount, right? If we look at moles, sometimes we're using exponents and you know 0. 0.0000 or, or something weird like that. Uh, if we use percent, uh, again, it's too small. So parts per million is usually more useful. And uh, so what a part per million is, it's a milligram per liter. So these are totally interchangeable here, in interchanged all the time. You've got a report, it'll say ppm. You have a report, it'll say milligrams per liter. It's the exact same unit. Okay, and we'll talk about why that's a million. Um, next day, and we'll do some samples. Um, anyone know what this one here is? This little guy? It's micro. That's a micro, yeah, a microliter per liter. Uh, we're not going to think too much in terms of microliters in this class. I do sometimes in the lab, but sometimes when you're doing some biological stuff, you're measuring things in microliters, very, very small quantities. Uh, but for the most part in this course, that's not going to be a concern. But you might see the micro once in a while. Parts per million can sometimes be too big, so sometimes we will go down to parts per billion. And I've even seen once or twice parts per trillion. At this point, there's very, very small amounts there, which is almost insignificant. And then the last thing we're going to talk about, which is going to be a bit of a stretch initially, is something called milliequivalents. Okay, so this is something that's kind of, um, I would call it old school. But it's still used, particularly in the area of water quality and pharmacology, believe it or not. People are still using something called milli equivalents. So milli, this is like a milliliter, right? It's the, uh, the metric thing, so it's a small amount. And equivalence has to do with valence in terms of reactivity. So it's kind of like moles per liter, but it's millimoles per liter, and they're throwing the valence in there. Okay? So we'll, we'll, we'll get into that uh, next day. But it's, uh, it's useful in some circumstances. So that's all I have for you today. We're going to do some, get right into some of these calculations on Wednesday in terms of how to do them. Um, I'm hoping, hoping this recording worked okay for anybody who can't uh, make it. 